Hello, this is Nick Inspinger again. I'm honored to be back to APP to APP to discuss endocrine emergencies. Um, I just wanted to review a few emergencies or situations that may not be high on the differentials, however, should be considered uh, with any patient presenting with, you know, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, uh, tachycardia, palpitations, or other symptoms that may not be lined up with uh, anything specific that you're finding. Now, a lot of these tests you may not do in the emergency department. However, uh, with these patients, if you're caring for them within the inpatient setting, this may be something that you do um, delve in a little bit deeper to try to figure out what's going on, maybe even conjunction with endocrinology. Now, if you work up in an area like I do, uh, very small, very rural, we don't have endocrinology. So any patients that we find maybe particular problems that may be due to an endocrine type of emergency or problem often have to be referred down to the city for further evaluation problems I wanted to go over with today. Uh, mainly primary adrenal insufficiency, which is Addison's disease. Uh, this is something that was found in JFK. This is something he dealt with for quite some time. Um, if you ever seen that movie Parkland, uh, you'll see when he's brought into the emergency department, um, the uh, head uh, physician brings in a bunch of um, hydrocortisone um, for his treatment therapy. Um, another one is pheochromocytoma. This is a surgical intervention that can uh, be curative for this. Um, different various causes of different diabetes. So there's type 1, type 2, which we're very familiar with. Now there's diabetes insipidus, which is not so familiar. I know we all have to know about it for the boards and other things like that, but we often forget about it because it's not something that we consider quite often. Um, ketoacidosis is something that is quite frequently seen in the hospital and emergency department. Further, um, hyperosmolar hyperglycemic states, HSS or HHS, SIADH, another good one for the boards, parathyroid issues and thyroid issues. Um, I'm going to go over these individually and kind of break them down. The main things I always found was breaking down, especially the different forms of diabetes, as well as uh, where that sits with um, diabetes insipidus compared to SIADH. Those are important things to differentiate between the two. And once you do get it, it's actually not as difficult as it sounds. So first off, starting with adrenal insufficiency. Um, adrenal insufficiency is typically due to some form of autoimmune problem. You can also get uh, overuse of steroid. There's various infections that can cause it as well as or, uh, various medications. Um, this cortisol, we all know, is a stress hormone. It helps regulate stress, blood pressure, and other issues. Um, it's a very important part of the daily um, interactions and metabolisms and other things within the body. Um, this again falls back on the Addison's disease like we talked about that uh, uh, JFK experienced back in the, when he was alive. Um, it can be affected by radiation like we talked about before, steroid use, infection, tumors, all those kind of other things. Um, and it's often kind of subtle. Usually patients know exactly what's going on with them because they have a previous diagnosis, but it's something that should be considered, especially in those patients that develop these signs and symptoms, maybe even over an extended period of time that we're trying to figure out exactly what's going on. Um, sign, common signs and symptoms of these patients, they feel very fatigued. They might have a little bit of weight loss, decreased appetite, this is something you often see on the boards, the darkening of the skin, face and hands. I've never seen anything like that before. Granted, I think I've only seen uh, adrenal insufficiency maybe once or twice. Um, and it was nothing that I diagnosed as something that came about. Um, orthostatic low blood pressure. Those patients that kind of have this variable blood pressure that you go through their medications, you don't see anything that's really standing out or they're not taking anything. They're hydrating themselves. The rest of their lab work doesn't look poor and you're thinking like what could this be adrenal insufficiency could be something that you do see further women um again so not something i've seen definitely good for the boards decreased armpit and pubic hair and uh, decreased sex drive or something that you can see as well now when you're diagnosing something like this you're going to go through the whole gambit sometimes it's just going to be something of exclusion lower down on the differentials uh, but what you're going to do is you're looking for these uh 
hormone levels to try to figure out, is it the adrenals that are causing it or is it higher up? Any kind of endocrine disorder is typically usually a feedback loop. So you got to figure out which portion of the, of the loop has the problem. Is it coming from the adrenals? Is it coming from the pituitary? Is it coming from the hypothalamus? You kind of work your way up. So you, you know, establish the level of deficit. Um, serum cortisol levels, ACTH levels. We'll go over that in just a second. Typically, these are best uh, drawn when the patient is wake, you know, first waking up. Not really practical in the emergency department, but you may be doing that within the hospital setting. And then again, something that can happen, there's adrenal insufficiency, but the more worrisome thing within the emergency department is an adrenal crisis. These are kind of things you don't wait for labs, you just treat them, and we'll go over that as well. Um, some imaging you may do, you may do, you know, abdomen, um, MRI or CTs looking for any kind of tumors, especially down lower in the adrenal areas or up in the brain looking for any form of um, pituitary tumors and other things like that. And one thing I will say, going back to the signs and symptoms as well, there are certain things that the adrenals do and they regulate, and those are usually due to the steroids that are along with the cortisol. So there's uh, mineral corticoids and there's glucocorticoids, and these things will be regulated through this feedback loop uh, with uh, the adrenal function. So things like, you know, the salt craving or the um, hypostatic or hypotensive or orthostatic blood pressures, those things are usually mineral corticoid levels that have dropped, and that's why you get these kind of symptoms. Whereas things like fatigue, weight loss, decreased appetite, those things can be affected by the glucocorticoids, which are also uh, regulated through this system as well. We'll go over that as well. So brief review, there's a glucocorticoid, which, you know, regulate metabolism, inflammation. Inflammation, you can see that why, because when you take prednisone, solumedrol, decadron, those are all glucocorticoids. And as you take those things, you can see why the adrenal suppression could happen, because if it's a feedback loop, you're taking these medications, it's lowering or uh, increasing these glucocorticoid levels. Your body says, maybe I don't need quite so much decreases it. So if you take them over a long period of time, it's going to take a while for those body, your body to uh, start building that back up again. Then there's mineral corticoids, which is not something we give all that often, but they're responsible for salt regulation, uh, primarily potassium, sodium, water regulation, mineral uh, metabolism, uh, mimics aldosterone. So those kind of things are all stuff that kind of regulate uh, blood pressures. So you can see why if cortisol level drops, glucocorticoid level drops, mineral corticoid level drops, you can see why you'd get the fatigue on the glucocorticoid side, and you can see why you could get the changes in the blood pressure and the salt cravings and such on the mineral corticoid side. Those are very important to know. So the hormones involved, like we said, cortisol, which is a glucocorticoid sterile hormone, um, it's secreted by the adrenal glands. It's a stress hormone, helps regulate stress, helps with blood pressure, assists with inflammation and infection. Um, it's an important thing. So you can see why if you cut that off, why the blood pressures would suffer, um, metabolism would suffer, appetites would suffer, all those kind of same weight loss, stuff like that. So if you look at this picture, there's a feedback loop that comes. So the cortisol level comes from the adrenal glands. However, that cortisol release is stimulated by the pituitary gland and that ACTH secretion, which is then triggered, you know, before that by the CRH level, uh, which is the corticotropin releasing hormone. And so there's a feedback. So if the cortisol level drops, then the CRH level increases to increase the ACTH level, to increase the cortisol level. Once it regulates back to itself, there's a feedback loop, and then those levels drop again. So those things are important. They call that the pituitary um, adrenal axis. So that's the whole feedback system. And you can see, if, so if the cortical steroid levels are low, but the ACTH level is high, maybe that's coming from the adrenal gland versus, you know, if it's further up, ACTH is low, cortisol is low, but the CRH level is high, maybe it's coming from the pituitary or vice versa. So there's a there's a whole system there. I mean, you can kind of look back upwards. So it's kind of like looking behind yourself on the road and seeing what was behind me that may have been causing that problem.
other hormones that are affected by this, renin, aldosterone, like we said, uh, renin affects sodium and potassium, um, helps regulate blood pressure. Aldosterone, which is another mineral corticoid in the adrenal, helps with the water and salt regulation. So those kind of things would affect blood pressure as well. So that's important. So any kind of cortisol, mineral corticoid, uh, glucocorticoid, any of those things within the endocrine system uh, affects, was going to affect electrolyte imbalances. It's going to cause um, blood pressure regulation to not be as um, ideal as it should. And you're also going to have, you know, differences in metabolism and all those other, other things. So there's different types of adrenal insufficiency. Those is primary. Uh, usually this is just caused straight by the adrenal glands. Everything above it looks okay. Um, it causes uh, decreased aldosterone, decreased cortisol production. Um, in the acute setting, that's what they call an adrenal crisis. So if these levels just drop off. You're going to have serious problems. If it's something that's regulated over a period of time, like Addison's disease, and you can treat it with you know uh, hydrocortisone, or, or other um, steroids, that's more of a chronic problem, which is, like I said, uh, associated with um, Addison's disease. The primary symptoms are often nonspecific. Like we said, patient may be fatigued, patient may uh, have a lower um, uh, uh, metabolism level, they may have kind of lower blood pressures, not anything that really stands out, but some things you may notice on their labs are they have a low sodium level, like remember we talked about with that sodium regulation uh, with the mineral corticoid levels, uh, hyperkalemia again with the mineral corticoid, so there's not that balance between the two, and some of them may suffer from just this hypoglycemia that seems to go through as far as the metabolism goes. Now, if you go on past that, more of a central problem, secondary, tertiary, usually that's a brain issue, uh, due to the ACTH, which is higher up, um, could be due to a growth um, tumor from or radiation to the brain. Stuff, you know, they maybe um, have found something, thyroid, something else, got radiation up in that area, causing that hypothalamus to not work so well. Sometimes you can see skin changes on those. Dehydration usually doesn't occur. Um, GI symptoms are less common, anxiety palpitations. Again, you can see why this is kind of like a, there's no specific thing that's really sending it out. So a lot of times these are differentials that you kind of think of after others are excluded. So this is from up to date. Different, our, Distinguishing between the primary and secondary adrenal insufficiencies, you can see that, you know, morning typical levels, you draw the ACTH, the serum cortisol, if it's on the lower half or the upper half, it kind of gives you a guidance. What This is likely an adrenal primary, which is, you know, the lower down versus the central, which is higher up. Um, and then you can keep going from that point to try to figure out what's exactly going on. Here's some MRIs to kind of show you on the left-hand side. Um, I don't know if this is going to show me or not, but uh, you can see this adrenal mass here um, causing it. And then on, the, on this one on the brain, you can see this pituitary mass. So this over here uh, would be more of your, your uh, primary. Over here is more of your secondary, tertiary, or central problem. Always think, I mean, with all of these things, with endocrine type problems, always think further up, think malignancy, think tumor, other things that could be causing it as well. So to diagnose this, uh, you're going to measure the cortisol level. So is it low? Is it normal? That's where you're going to go from there. So if the cortisol level is low, you got some form of adrenal suppression especially if everything above it is elevated within that feedback loop. If it's normal, you're pretty much done. So, but if it is low, you know there's an adrenal suppression, but however, where's that coming from? So which, which type is it? So then you're gonna measure the ACTH, which is what coming from the pituitary, which is what's telling the adrenals to produce the cortisol. If it's high or if it's low, that's your next factors to try to figure out. So if the ACTH is high, you're gonna think that there's probably something going on with the actual adrenal gland, because that means that that pituitary is producing the hormone 
and telling it to produce cortisol, but it's just not listening to it. However, if the ACTH is low, that means that it's further up. So that's why the adrenals are not producing what they do because they're not getting enough single signal further up. So you get think maybe there's some form of intracranial pathology at that point. So that's when you would typically order, you know, the brain MRI, uh, the brain CT with contrast, other things looking a little bit higher up there just to see if you can figure out exactly what the cause is. So adrenal crisis is what we were kind of talking about before. This is something in the emergency department that is, is uh, rather um, concerning if you do ever see it, especially these patients a lot of times coming, they know they have adrenal insufficiency. Um, and so you might have uh, patients that come in in these situations. If you have endocrinology or any kind of help um, to kind of stabilize these patients, because they can go into this vasodilatory shock where they look horrible, their blood pressure drops out, they start vomiting like crazy, they become confused, they go into a coma, all those kind of other things. So typically these patients, CBC, CMP, serum cortisol level, granted it's not morning, but you need something, serum ACTH, um, you're looking for where that's coming from. If they have it established, you'll probably know. Um, EKG, you're looking for any irregularities. So if their potassium levels have dropped, you know, you may get uh, T wave changes that are no noted on the EKG, you may get arrhythmias. And then again, CT of the head, CT of the brain, or whether or not you need to do it lower down. You don't wait for labs on these things, though. If you know this is going on and you know that the person is, is in this potential vasodilatory shock area and you know they have this history of adrenal crisis, you need to act before the labs come back. And typically, that's tons of, you want to give them fluids, you want to give them maintenance fluids, and then you give them boluses of hydrocortisone um, to try to bring that cortisol level up. Um, if you don't have that, dexamethasone would work um, or solumedrol, but it's not the ideal to give. It's the hydrocortisone. Consulting endocrinology, um, if you find some kind of mass neurosurgery uh, up in the brain, especially, is something that you're going to consult from that point. I wanted to give you this chart. These are the different levels or potencies of the different um, uh, steroids that we often give, and it kind of shows you the glucocorticoid as well as the mineral corticoid. Um, so remember the, the glucocorticoid is more of the anti-inflammatory, whereas the mineral corticoid is like the regulation of sodium, potassium, and other things. So you can see why hydrocortisone would be a great choice because it's basically one-to-one. -one. They're both the same, even right in the middle. Um, as you go down, things like prednisone, it's more higher on the glucocorticoid level. So is uh, uh, solumedrol, so is dexamethasone, even though dexamethasone has that huge, long half-life. So that's what you're looking for. That hydrocortisone would definitely be the ideal if you have that available. If you don't, you got to give them something, then you're going to give them the dexamethasone or you're going to give them the solumedrol. So moving on to the next one, which is pheochromocytoma. This is, uh, I remember during my um, uh, time in PA school during uh, the emergency room uh, time, they asked me to give, uh, what was it, three surgical um, fixes for endocrine uh, related issues, and I missed this one, pheochromocytoma. Um, I actually, I don't think I got any of them, to tell you the truth, but then I asked them, and I think they only got this one. So this is one thing, though, it can be surgical. Um, it's something that should be on your mind, especially those patients that have, you know, chronic headaches. They have continued high blood pressure that's just persistent. It won't go down. Um, they cause themselves to sweat every so often. They can't stop sweating. Uh, palpitations, anxiety, those kind of things. This is something to always kind of consider in the back. And what it is, is the catecholamine secreting tumor. So remember those things like epinephrine, norepinephrine, all those kind of things, those are catecholamines. So those things are being secreted um, and it's causing these stimulation without, with, throughout the system. Most of them are benign. Uh, it's very rare and mostly seen between people that are 40 and 50 like myself, but can cause a hypertensive emergency. So, um, and uh, one thing that's kind of interesting, I didn't know this, is like up to 50% of them are diagnosed with autopsy. So they weren't something that was thought of before or something that um, 
was known about prior to their death. So that's, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, symptoms present in only 50% of patients. That's not something I used to know about. I used to think that, you know, all of these patients were symptomatic. But again, it's something to always think about, especially those patients 40 to 50. You're giving them, you know, tons of blood. They're on four different blood pressure medications. So you cannot bring them down. Um, it's something to think about. Those lower on the list, you tried everything else. It's not coming down. All other labs look normal. The pheochromocytoma is something to think about. Especially if they have this, you know, this classic triad of hypertension, headaches, they're sweating. Um, they may have other symptoms such as palpitations, uh, shortness of breath, pallor. Um, less common, it may be a you know, cause of cardiomyopathy, but you can see that because of that hypertension over a certain amount of time, you're going to get that increased um, uh, uh, pressure on the heart. So you may get things like cardiomyopathy and such. Workups, you're going to use the 24-hour unfractionated calicolamines and meta nephrines. I probably said that wrong. Um, again, not something you're going to necessarily do within the emergency department. This patient may have a hypertensive crisis, gets admitted. You're trying to bring their blood pressure down. You're thinking of those differentials. So you think about those kind of things. So you're going to get this test, comes back positive. Think of MRI or CT of the abdomen and pelvis. And then you're going to try to figure out from there because the treatment is very intensive. Um, it takes a lot of effort and takes a lot of specialty. So if some, one of these things are found um, it's something, especially in my area, that are going to be transferred down to where there's endocrinology available, and they should be admitted under that. Um, catecholamines, this is just a review or made up of the, you know, by the adrenal glands in response to stress, just like cortisol. Um, they're both hormones and neurotransmitters. Maintaining homeostasis, there's parasympathetic, which is like your resting system, sympathetic, which is your fight or flight. So you can see why if there's, you know, a stimulation of your, you know, epinephrine, norepinephrine, why a person with pheochromocytoma might feel palpitations, they may feel anxious, um, their blood pressure may be high, that's that sympathetic response that you may get. And then the three types we all know, dop dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. I always looked at it as far as from the medications we give, what we give them for, um, you know, dopamine to raise blood pressure, uh, norepinephrine to raise blood pressure, especially with like sepsis, other things like that, levofeds, and then epinephrine as well. You can see why all of those things would raise up uh, those levels. So the treatment, again, endocrinology consultation, if you live up where I am, that person's not going to stay here. They're going to be flown somewhere else. Um, you're going to admit them, and then there's that whole complicated beta alpha blockade, which um, I'm no expert in doing. Um, you can look that up, but that's something endocrinology is going to have to be involved with that. And you're going to be doing this thing to get their blood pressure down to a certain point, um, so there can be some form of surgical intervention to try to remove these things. So, uh, moving on, diabetes. Um, you all know that's Wilford Brimley. He used to be on all the commercials about diabetes. Um, I wanted to go over the different types. Now, some of the first stuff is going to be pretty obvious. You guys all know one, diabetes one, diabetes two. Um, but I want to go over some of the other stuff that's maybe outside um, when they get uncontrolled, end up in an emergency type setting. But I want to start with diagnosis. So type one. We all know those are the insulin dependent patients. They don't produce insulin. So you have to give them insulin to help bring their sugars down. Um, basically their pancreas just doesn't do it anymore. Uh, whether it's beta isolate cells, whatever, whatever the cause is, um, you have to give them insulin to bring it down. Now, if that insulin drops and then the sugar levels get too high, your body tries to figure out ways to get rid of it. So, um, and also tries to, you know, it doesn't really, um, absorb it as well to actually know that it's actually has enough so it tries to get rid of it through polyuria um tries to dilute it through polydipsia however it's not being you know transferred into the cells so kind of your body kind of feels like it's still starving so that's when you get the polyphagias and you get the weight loss now if this goes unchecked what you're going to get is you're going to get a ph shift because there's so much sugar still within the veins and within your body. And that's when you end up going into that ketoacidosis phase. So you're getting metabolic acidosis. Patients may get abdominal pain. Um, 
patients I've seen, whenever they have abdominal pain and ketoacidosis, are usually children. I haven't seen that too much in adults. I have seen nausea, vomiting with it, associated with it. Um, Kussmaul respirations, that's when it goes a little bit too far. Metabolic acidosis sits in, your body's trying to rid itself of all of that acid. So it's this deep, fast respiratory response that you can see uh, within these patients. Um, usually that's a later on and they start getting neurological symptoms, including loss or uh, altered level of consciousness with those patients. Type 2 diabetes, most common. Um, these patients are usually obese. They start developing insulin resistance. Um, they're usually asymptomatic. It's kind of found later on. Maybe you're doing a routine A1C, patients gaining weight. Um, and uh, maybe there's a family history or something. You do the you know, postprandial two hours greater than 200. Blood sugar is greater than 126 fasting, or if you find an A1C that's greater than six and a half, depending on your reference, these patients will fall into that. Uh, a lot of times these things can be changed around. Uh, these patients can you know, exercise, they can change their diet, hopefully change by losing weight. Uh, if it doesn't, they'll transition over to type one um, and then eventually you know, slowly start using more and more insulin. Whereas also insulin type one diabetes can also be called juvenile diabetes, which is something that can be uh, diagnosed early on. Um, a lot of the type one, you know, once you get into the DKA ketoacidosis level, um, a lot of those patients I've seen, I mean, they come in, they just say, I can't drink enough water and I'm super tired and I'm always hungry. That's kind of like a, man, nah, maybe I need to check your blood sugar. Emergency department workup. So you get that patients, like we just said, you get the ones that tell you, you know, I don't feel right. I can't stop drinking water. I can't, you know, stop peeing. Um, I just don't feel right. I've been vomiting. Maybe I have some abdominal pain, other things like that. You're going to work them up um, to uh, try to figure out the extent, especially right off the bat. If they have diabetes, you're going to look for ketoacidosis. Um, you're going to look for DKA. You're going to look for that hyperosmolic state, all those kinds of other things. So as far as the workup goes, you're obviously going to look for a CBC. You're going to look for infection. Right. Uh, you're also going to look for, you know, are they really high levels of hemoglobin hematocrit? Are they dehydrated? Diabetics can have a high level infection. Infection can also prompt elevations in your um, sugar levels. So a patient can have a secondary infection that makes them go into DKA. So that's important. Um, CMP, you're, that's important for uh, primarily their potassium level, but you're also looking at their kidney function. Diabetics can also have a lot of kidney type issues. It'll give you a glucose level, but also prior to the initiation of any kind of insulin, you got to really know what their potassium level is because any insulin um, that's given to the patient will drop those levels. So it's kind of important. So we'll go over that too on how to do it. Magnesium level, if, if, uh, your potassium level is low. You also know your magnesium level is low. Your phosphorus level may be low as well. All those things kind of go together. They build upon each other. That's something you're going to have to check because that potassium level won't come up unless that magnesium level comes up too. Lipase, is there something going on with their pancreas? Alcohol level, those patients that drink tons and tons can go into DK, especially if they have a history of um, underlying diabetes. Lactate levels, so you're looking for lactic acidosis. Uh, for sepsis, but that's also for DKA as well. Serum ketones, uh, is your body have so much sugar in there that it's unable, that the fat's starting to break down, um, that releasing ketones to try to get your uh, uh, brain supplied with any kind of nutrients because that there's no insulin to bring that sugar up there. Your analysis, you're looking for protein, but you're also looking for ketones and tons of urine in there. Urine toxicity, so you know that's just important. That's kind of if you get urine, you work in an emergency department, you're always going to get utox, especially if these patients have altered. So you're trying to figure out that's maybe a differential. And then there's VBG and there's AVG. Um, that's what you're going to look for for that ketoacidosis, that metabolic acidosis, especially with the ion ion gap. And we'll go over that in a minute. When do you do the VBG versus AVG? I'll go over that in a minute. Blood cultures are always good, especially finding for secondary infection. Um, just a reference, um, what you're looking for mostly in these, obviously, is that metabolic acidosis. So that pH is going to be low because they're acidotic. Um, their PCO2 is going to be low as well, but their bicarb is also low. So these things are all down. Um, that's for a clinical indication of underlying metabolic acidosis. 
you're going to get a chest x-ray. You're looking for any infection in the lungs. You're going to get an EKG, especially, you know, if there's different things going on with their electrolyte levels. Um, if they're altered and you don't have a necessary cause, you're going to consider CT of the brain as well. So VBG versus ABG. I personally like VBG a lot, especially with these patients that have um, ketoacidosis or you're trying to rule it out because one, it can be drawn just with the lab work. So they can just draw it as they're drawing all the other stuff. Uh, they don't have to have RT come in or you come in and do an arterial puncture that's sent off uh, or done bedside separately than this. Um, so, you know, just getting that off, that's a good thing. Now, the difference is, is there's a little bit of variability. Now, VBG is often good for things like metabolic problems. Um, however, it's not so good with any kind of respiratory problems. If you want a more accurate reading on a respiratory issue, you're going to want to do an ABG. Um, VBGs are less painful. Like I said, they're quicker. pH may be slightly lower, but it's very minimal. Um, the lactate may be a little bit higher, again, minimal. It's not recommended with acute respiratory patients. So like I said, if you want an adequate or accurate CO2 or an accurate O2 level, that's when you want that ABG. However, you're just looking for metabolic problems like metabolic or acidosis or ketoacidosis, that AB or that um, VBG is just, just fine. ABGs are way more painful. You think about it, you're sticking it straight into the um, the uh, a radial artery or down in the femoral artery. Usually an RT has to do it or you have to do it, which pulls you away from other things. It's more accurate and it's best used for um, hypoxic patients or other respiratory type complaints. So main thing, VBG, if you're thinking metabolic, quick and easy, can be drawn with all the other stuff versus the ABG, which, you know, that's something that um, uh, you can do more with uh, patients that have uh, respiratory type issues. So keep diabetic ketoacidosis. So how you diagnose this is there's that classic triad. So the patient's going to come in, you're going to take their blood sugar. It's like 400. So it's way too high, right? Um, or it's even higher, 500. It just reads high. Um, they're going to be symptomatic a lot of times. They're vomiting. Um, they're just, they don't feel right. Um, they may be asymptomatic, especially if they have a long established history. But the main thing you're going to do is you're going to get that VBG and you're going to find an acid, a metabolic acidosis, right? Their pH is low, their PCO2 is low, their bicarb low. And then also there's also anion gap metabolic acidosis. Now, that's important to look at, especially for true diagnosis. But a lot of times, um, just looking at the metabolic acidosis and finding that on a patient, even if you don't have an ABG or VBG, if you do a CMP and you look at their CO2 and you see that it's low, that's a clinical indicator. Um, anion gap is the differences between the anions and the, and the cations. Um, the wider the level, the more worrisome as far as it goes for metabolic acidosis. Um, and you're also going to look for those ketones. They're often caused by, you know, infection or they're often caused by misdiagnosis or mis, um, misdosing of uh, medications. I just didn't take it. I didn't know, or I just, you know, binged out today and I didn't take anything. So that's something to, uh, to think about. Um, I work in corrections on, a, on occasion. Um, every Thursday is when the um, inmates get like their what they call their commissary. So it's things like honey buns and, and donuts and, and junk food type things. So all of the diabetics Friday morning are always through the roof. So I have to often adjust their insulin levels to help bring them back down. Treatment though for this, so if it's way high, you have all these problems, you got to make them NPO so they, they can't eat anything more because they already have enough sugar and glucose in their body. Their body needs to get rid of that. So you need to, to hold back on all these things. A lot of times they're vomiting anyway, so you don't want them to have some form of aspiration or such. Rapid infusion, infusion of um, uh, fluids. You want to base these on corrected sodium. So that's one thing always to have because if your sugar's high, your sodium level is not always going to be the most accurate. So things like med calc and other things, um, that's important to have because you can correct the sodium to actually get you a real level. Uh, you always want to um, address the magnesium and the potassium prior to it initiating your insulin. So remember, if you have a 
even normal or a low level and you start insulin, that's going to drop that out. You're going to get cardiac arrhythmias. You're going to get all kinds of things. So there is a um, pathway, which we'll go over in just a second to kind of show you how to do this. Typically going to start uh, insulin regular. You're going to give them a bolus of 0.1 units per kilogram. Some places don't recommend bolus anymore. Some places just go straight to the insulin drip, which is exactly the same, which is nice because there's a, you know, the bolus is 0.1, but the insulin drip is also 0.1 kilogram per hour. Um, if the pH is less than 6.9, usually these patients are pretty sick. That's when you're going to give some sodium bicarbonate to try to bring that acid level back in control. And obviously these patients are going to be admitted. You're going to watch them for a while. Main thing you're going to do is you're going to wait for that sugar to drop down to about 250 before you consider any kind of uh, oral fluids or anything at that point uh, or switching them to metformin or some other form of uh, medications, whether they just stay on uh, insulin. That's another thing, but all, that's all patient specific. This is a good thing to have um, right there in the middle. I wanted to show you that mostly uh, the potassium there. So you want to establish that they have good renal function. So remember, if a patient doesn't have good renal function, their potassium level is going to be up. Or if they're taking way too many of ACE inhibitors or ARBs or something, it's going to raise their potassium level as well. Uh, but you want to make sure they have good renal function. And then you're going to look at their potassium level. So see if it's low. That's pretty obvious. You're not going to, you're going to hold it. You're going to give them insulin. But the main thing that is to note is that even if the potassium is normal, you're still going to give them potassium. Then you're going to start the insulin. Now, if it's high, greater than 5.3, I think it, where we were is 5.5. You don't need to give them potassium, but you do need to check it every two hours as you're giving insulin. So that's something that's going to be repetitively done. Uh, it's going to drive the patient nuts, but it's something that really needs to happen because if they bottom out at that point, um, that's pretty significant. All right, so that's uh, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. The next one you often see is this hyperosmolar uh, hyperglycemic state. So this one for me was always easiest is basically this is diabetic ketoacidosis uh, without the acidosis, uh, but dehydrated. Um, so they have high blood pressure. They're not as or sorry, high blood glucose. They're not dehydrated, or sorry, not, sorry, let me start back. They have high um, blood sugars, but they're not acidotic, but they're dehydrated. So a lot of times these have very high levels of osmolarity within their serum because all that fluid is gone. Um, so they have a lot of solutes within their system and they need to be hydrated, but they're not in this, the realm of acidosis. So their VBG is within the normal ranges. Their CO2 still looks good. Um, so they're not quite to that state. Now, the treatment's a little bit different, um, but it's something to be aware of. So you commonly see this in type 2 diabetics. It can be fatal. Um, it can produce uh, or progress. Um, the main thing with these patients is that they're dehydrated. So they have this hyperosmolar state within their um in their uh, in their body in their bloodstream because all the fluid is gone a lot of times that's just trying to get the sugar out so they're just flushing all that out but they're leaving a lot of the solutes and everything in the bloodstream so they're dehydrated and their sugar remains high um a lot of times their sugars are higher than 500 600 they have signs of dehydration but like i said no signs of ketoacidosis they don't have the ketones they don't have the metabolic acidosis other things like that and these also can be caused by you know thyroid thyroid thiazide diuretics, glucocorticoids. Remember, anytime you give some form of steroid to a diabetic, you're going to raise their blood sugars up. Lithiums, psychotics, all those kind of things can also be causes of this. The main treatment goal is you're going to replace the lost volume. You're going to address the osmolarity. Any electrolyte imbalances, you're going to you're going to fix, treat the hyperglycemia. Again, if you're giving them insulin or some other form, you got to make sure that their potassium levels are OK. Magnesium levels are OK. And then un manage the underlying condition that caused it. So is it because of they're on the diuretics? Is it because they took way too many steroids? What is the problem? But the main thing is hydration. So even hydrating, hydrating these patients will bring their blood sugars down. Then you further get them down and then you address any kind of electrolyte problems at that point. So the, that's the main thing with me is that DKA, they're acidotic, okay? They have ketones, um, they have high blood sugar.
Um, HHS, they have high blood sugar, but they don't have ketones. They don't have acidosis, but they're dehydrated and their osmolar state's high. So their osmolarity is very high. All right, so diabetes insipidus. This is one that we uh, know, maybe see quite a bit. Um, sometimes you have to review it and you're kind of like, oh yeah, that, I remember that, but uh, what exactly was it? So it's caused by a decrease of the antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. So antidiuretic hormone causes your body to um, not diurese itself, right? So um, um, anti, you know, so these kind of patients uh, will, you know, pee themselves quite a bit. So they'll pee quite often. Um, familiar, it may be genetic, it may be caused by neurosurgery or trauma to the head, some form of pituitary issue, cancers, uh, electrolyte issues from anorexia or some form of intrinsic disease may be causing all, you know, some of these type of issues. So you got to look at it uh, as to what exactly is causing this problem. So like I said, polyuria, so they're not holding on um, to the fluid anymore. They're just peeing it out. So they're peeing a ton of it out. So 20 liters a day it can be up to. They're peeing all night. They're very thirsty because they're peeing all that out. Um, it can cause vascular collapse because there's nothing left in those pipes. And so they can't sustain themselves. So they'll actually kind of start to clamp down at some point. So the main diagnosis with diabetes insipidus is that, you know, you're peeing all that fluid out because of that ADH uh, is decreased, but you're keeping that sodium in there. So that sodium level is high. So diabetes insipidus, you're going to get a high sodium level. So 145 or so. Now that's different than SIADH, which is the, you know, inappropriate secretion of ADH, which we'll go over in a minute. The differentiation with that is that the sodium level will be low in that. So insipidus high, uh, SIADH low for the sodium, okay? So you can see this. So if you're, you're peeing all that fluid out, but you're keeping everything on the inside, the sodium's high, the serum osmolarity is going to be high because you have all those solutes in there still. Um, but the urine is just basically the fluid. So you're just peeing out the fluid. The urine osmolarity will be low. So main thing with this is so if you get that patient that's really high sodium level and you're thinking SI or diabetes insipidus, maybe in the inpatient setting, you're going to that's why you're going to get the serum osmolarity. You're going to get the urine osmolarity uh, and you're going to get the urine sodium because you're going to try to see where that's going, where it's, you know, what, what it's, this is going to help you cue you into that diagnosis. Just a, a real thing. I mean, antidiuretic hormone is vasopressin. It's, pre, you know, produced by the hypothalamus. There's different causes, central, all those kind of other things. But the main thing, what it does is it regulates sodium. Okay. And that's why we we're talking about before. So whether it's diabetes insipidus, where it's too much sodium, uh, SIADH, where there's too little sodium because, you know, you're retaining the fluid and it's diluting it out. Um, that's what, that's what ADH does. It's, it monitors and regulates sodium. And it's also, you know, why we use sometimes vasopressin for hypotensive patients. We add it along with another medication because you're trying to help that sodium regulation. Uh, the effects of osmotic balance, like we just talked about, blood pressure, kidney function, um, helps promote water reabsorption, like we talked about, whether it's spewing it all out with diabetes insipidus or holding on to it, SIADH, that's what it does. So there's different causes of it, autoimmune, pituitary, uh, trauma. I thought trauma is kind of interesting. Um, surgery is another common cause that can happen with this. Nephrogenic is a less common. Other medications, and I, especially in my job now, especially with there's, you know, so many psychiatric patients that we see um, various types of um, uh, medications can cause these problems uh, to develop. So moving on. So the diamond, so the emergency department workup, like you said, I mean, you may not diagnose this in the ER and maybe diagnose later on once the patient is admitted, but you're going to get those initial labs and what you're going to get, you know, patient comes in, uh, they're peeing a ton. You're going to be thinking, oh man, does this person have DKA? 
Um, or is there something else going on? You're going to get that CPC, like we talked about with DKA, looking for infection, looking for dehydration. CMP, you're looking for the glucose levels, potassium levels, um, renal function, magnesium, again, with the, with the potassium. Ketones for the DKA, lactate levels, um, like we talked about earlier, urinalysis and blood culture. But the thing you're primarily going to find, one, is that <clears throat> the CMP, the sodium level is high. But you're also going to notice that the urine is extremely dilute. And when you notice that, because remember, it's peeing it all out, but it's holding on to that sodium in there. So that's one of the things you're going to cue you in right off the bat. Hmm, maybe this is diabetes insipidus. You're going to do a chest x-ray. You're going to look at their heart, look and see if there's anything else going on. These are kind of just bread and butter ER things that you always do. Um, you know, an EKG, looking for any kind of cardiac irregularities. Um, if you think something is further up in the head, pituitary stuff, uh, CT, MRI of the brain, um, especially if they're altered or something in other ways. Otherwise, this kind of stuff is probably going to be done in the inpatient setting. GI treatment, you're going to give them vasopressin, which is obvious. Um, you're going to help kind of reverse the thing. Uh, thyroid, thiazide diuretics. Um, may help in nephrogenic um, issues. That's something I would definitely consult with endocrinology or um, um, renal if you had it. You can admit them uh, to endocrinology if available. Like you said, up in here, might be able to take care of it and then uh, you know move them along for an outpatient. Uh, if they have any positive brain injury, that's why the neurosurgery. But a lot of times, especially in my area, they're going to tell you, you know, just send them out. Um, desmopressin, that's something you're going to have to probably follow up with endocrinology and salt restriction as well. Um, so in contrast, SIADH, which is basically the opposite, it's the increased antidiuretic hormone. So it's holding on to all of that fluid. So thus it's diluting the amount of sodium that's in your blood. Um, so you're going to see with the diabetes insipidus, you're going to see the high sugar or high sodium levels. SIADH, you're going to see the low uh, sodium levels um, caused by medications, uh, meningitis, cancers can cause it. Now, the times I've ever seen this, it's usually always caused by medications. Um, things like um, what was the one? Uh, it was just on the other day. Um, sertralines can cause it. Um, all those kind of psychiatric type medications, those can all be uh, something that cause these kind of problems. And that's exactly what I, I had recently where a patient had uh, problems from, from those things. Uh, Kepra, he was also on Kepra. That can cause sodium dysregulation as well. They're often asymptomatic. However, if their sodium level drops enough, they can start to get that altered mentation. They can actually seize. They get confusion, coma. Um, I, I think it, when he went to the ER, the last one I saw, this was a few weeks ago, um, his sodium level was 116. He was actually alert still. Um, I was kind of surprised by that. Granted, when he got to the ER, they redrew it. It wasn't quite that low, but he was still less. I think he was like 124 or something like that. So, um Anyway, so like we were talking about earlier, the sodium level's low because it's holding on to the fluid, diluting it. So the serum osmolarity level is low because it's all the fluid, but it's not peeing out as much. So the solute content within the urine is high. And also that urine is going to be high because it's the sodium being excreted as well. So it's the polar opposite of these things. Um, and you're going to do the same thing, MRI for confusion or other kind of neuro suspicions. So the main thing I just want to tell you is that diabetes insipidus, high levels of sodium, diabetes or SIADH, low levels of sodium. Okay. And you can see with SIDH, because there's so much fluid remaining within the body, that the serum osmolarity is going to be low, but everything coming out of the body is going to be high versus vice versa with diabetes insipidus. These are some uh, values just to kind of show you. Uh, I wanted to compare and contrast the two things next to each other. Um, we're not able to do ADH levels up here, but I guarantee a lot of places you guys work are able to do that. Treatment, you're going to remove the cause. You're going to restrict the water. Um, 
In life-threatening situations, you may diurese these patients. You may give them 3% infusion, higher levels of um, solute or sodium concentration. That's obviously an inpatient. Um, once they get down to a certain level, less than 120, what is it, 6 or 4, I can't remember, uh, that's ICU status at that point. All right. So I hope those make sense. Those I always remember those being hard from, from school standpoint. Um, so main thing I want to go over too. So this is very common hypothyroid, um, but it can exacerbate and it can become an emergency uh, that you may see. Um, usually these patients are very poor looking. They do not look good, um, but it's something uh, to consider in some of these patients. A lot of times it's kind of older patients. They can be placed in a care home. That's when they get that, um, you know, mix edema, coma, stuff, there's things like that. Uh, there's different causes of hypothyroid. You know, there's Hashimoto's, that's an autoimmune disorder uh, where it attacks the thyroid. Medications can cause it. Uh, primarily, there are things like lithium um, or other medications that are deal with psychiatric issues. Um, tumors, uh, some people just don't have a thyroid gland. Um, my daughter was born with creatinism, so she, she already has... Uh, She's on thyroid supplementation. It's very rare, but it can happen. Usually the symptoms are very fatigued. You know, a lot of times in primary care, you actually just pick it up on routine labs or a person says, I just don't feel well. I've been extremely constipated and I'm gaining weight, uh, those kind of things. Um, intolerance to cold, they may be bradycardic. Diastolic hypertension may be noted. And primary, I mean, we all know this, the TSH is... Uh, uh, decreased, um, the free T4 is elevated. Um, I'm sorry, that's backwards. I, no, that's a typo in my case. Um, this should be the other way around. So TSH is elevated. Apologize for that. And the free T4 is decreased. So this is TSH. That's a typo. I, I apologize. Free T4. Because you can see, I mean, it's that feedback loop again where, um, the, you know, the, the it's trying to tell it to, you know, secrete more free T4, um, but it's not doing it. So that's, you know, there's different, there's primary, there's secondary, where exactly in the brain is it going on? Um, but it's typically, it's or it's caused by a decreased free T4. Now there's free T3, all those other things, but um, these ones are the primary ones you go after. Now, whether it's higher up in the brain, uh, there's an issue, or if it's down by the thyroid, that's when the you know imaging or ultrasounds or other things come into play. Um, chest X-ray, you may see some form of mass up in that area, uh, mediastinal problems. EKGs can show ventricular blocks, delays. They can show prolonged QT. Bradycardia is very common, especially if it gets significant. Now, the emergency department of fire, this is a very serious one. It's very rare. It can be fatal. It's where it gets so low, but it can be precipitated by infection with these patients. Uh, they have burns, surgeries, hemorrhages, um, therapies that they're taking for, you know, rheumatoid disorders, cancerous type disorders. But they do present with significant cardiac, neurological, and other things. Their body temper drop, you know, can drop. That's a really bad prognosis. Um, altered level of consciousness, they're hypothermic, their skin is just kind of like adenomous and it's flaking. Um, they don't have much neural reflexes, bradycardia, they may be fecally impacted. Again, you might see this in a person, patient that's like, you know, within a um, bedridden, skilled facility type thing. Um, here's an example. Um, see, that you can see the face um, swollen up, their they just are altered, their hair is falling out, uh, their skin is in really bad disorder. Um, these patients are really significantly low in thyroid hormone. Here's an example of some of the things you may see. I mean, bradycardia, you can see the T waves um, are changed here. They're inverted through the um, anterior area. Sometimes this QT prolongation here, um, you can see that. That's something that can cause. You might see heart blocks. Um, looks like there's nothing. There's some artifact, but that could be a heart block in there. Um, those kind of things. You're going to see that kind of irregular issues. 
you're going to treat the cause, you're going to support the care, you're going to give them, you know, that stimulant to try to get their, you know, adrenal glands to come kind of maybe help out, bring up the blood pressure, other things. They're going to get that IV T4. Uh, they might get uh, T3. These kind of things, again, through endocrinology consultation is what you're going to do to treat these patients. All right. In, in contrast, there's hyperthyroid, which most often it causes by Graves' disease, uh, which is an autoimmune disorder. You might feel goiters. They may have subacute thyroiditis to queer veins, um, some form of tumor up in their brain that's causing them to um, secrete too much. Uh, common symptoms, these, these patients, I just can't sit still. I'm always moving. Um, I don't feel, you know, I'm just anxious. I don't know why this is happening. I'm losing weight. I'm getting palpitations. Um, I, I am always hot all the time. Uh, as far as for your, your boards, that lid lag, um, they may have a goiter present. Those kind of things are what you're going to look for. Um, sometimes it may be overuse of their thyroid medicine. Um, that can be causing it, but otherwise, um, that's one thing to think about. So here's the that feedback loop. So your TSH is down because you're already producing more than enough free T4. So that feedback loop, the brain is trying to say, hey, tone it down, but you're still producing way too much. Now, where that's coming from, is it because the, you know, the brain is, you know, got pituitary is having an issue or is it a thyroid issue that takes more explain or more um, uh, investigative work? So CTI or CTMA, MR of the brain. And then, of course, the EKG, because you're looking for any cardiac irregularities. And then I just repeated that again. So let's move on past that. Uh, main thing, what you're looking for is thyroid storm. That's what you're worried about. So you get that patient who can't sit still or they're very tachycardic. You can come in with that person who's got ventricular tachycardia um, or they got um, SVT or they got RVR or something. You got to think maybe there's potential um, thyroid issues going on. Um, they may be delirious. They may have a high fever. Um, AFib with RVR, like we just talked about. Um, it may be, you know, stress or some kind of other cause, but it's very uncommon, but it can be very life threatening. So the treatment is to, to you know, figure out what the problem is. You're going to hydrate them. You're going to treat any other underlying problem. You're going to give them fluids. And then obviously there's the antithyroid medication. So the things that, you know, you might be seeing these patients given by endocrinology or within the um, primary care setting. Uh, propranolol kind of brings their heart rate down, calms them down a little bit. You may be having to give them some steroids, which can inhibit the um, free T4 and the free T3. Um, and then again, of course, if there's a fever and there's some form of antibiotics or they meet sepsis criteria, that's when you're going to be treating with antibiotics from there. Again, this is something you're going to be going through with uh, endocrinology, but um, it's something to be aware of as long as you have symptoms there. EKG, you know, something with these kind of patients, like I said, they come in with these extremely high heart rates, but you're going to see these tachycardias, whether it's, you know, sinus tachycardia, whether it's atrial fibrillation, RVR, like it is there. Um, but you're also going to see these, you know, big voltages and uh, LVH and all these other things because the heart has got these straining type patterns that you're going to see. And those kind of things here. Um, like I've said in other lectures, if you get these big, broad, uh, downward deflected uh, QRS waves um, in the V2 and then V5 of their upright, that's typically indicative of some uh, LVH. All right. So last, parathyroid, remember that's responsible for um, or, sorry, potassium calcium regulation. So there's hypo and there's hyper. Um, hypo is oftentimes seen when there's some kind of issue um, when they did some form of thyroid surgery or parathyroid because, you know, the parathyroid glands sit on top of the thyroid gland. So if something got nicked or missed or something, um, there could be an autoimmune disorder, um, reduced parathyroid hormone that can cause it. These can cause seizures, arrhythmias. Now, you know, because of you know, potassium is such a huge, or sorry, I keep saying potassium. Calcium is such a huge portion as is potassium, but calcium within the action potential of the heart for conduction, um, especially for contraction, if you have any decrease or increase in that level, you can see why it can cause irregularities or arrhythmias and other things. This can lead to heart failure. Most one thing you often have to think about is malignancy. Um, 
malignancy, especially within the bones and other things, uh, it's something to definitely consider. They can have prolonged QT syndromes. Uh, typically, the treatment with hypocalcemia, though, is you're going to give them calcium, you're going to give them vitamin D. Uh, those two go hand in hand, and also you're going to give them magnesium replacement. Um, what we used to do in the in the uh, in the hospital, a lot of times these patients that weren't too bad, we would just give them tums over a certain amount of days um, and see where it goes from there. So hyper um, often caused by you know um, some form of tumor. It causes hyper um, excretion of, of calcium levels. These patients may often produce with tons of kidney stones all the time. And you're like, why are you getting kidney stones all the time? You measure their PTH levels and they're off. So that's potentially a reason why you get this. Uh, they may affect their reflexes. They may be blazed, may be weak, uh, may be peeing a lot. So the body's trying to get rid of all that calcium. Uh, they may have that shortened PR value. Remember, because when you know that calcium in that, like we talked about before, is a major thing for um, conduction of the heart. So if you're getting too much, it's causing it to contract more and more and more. So you're going to get that shortened PR to try to in, increase in um, heart rate. You can go into arrhythmias and paroxysmal um, SVTs, stuff like that. So you want to address the cause, like we talked about earlier. You're going to hydrate them, try to get that level dropped. You're going to give them Lasix to try to pee it out. You're going to replace potassium and magnesium, and then the patient's going to get admitted uh, for further evaluation, especially from endocrinology of some sort. This is one thing I just wanted to show, uh, the action potential. Remember right up in here, that's when that, you know, calcium comes in, and then, you know, potassium is down the repolarization area, and then sodium is in there. So you can see, you know, contraction and then relaxation but it's major part so if this is too low um you know you're going to get something down here or if it's too high you're going to get something up higher so it's going to increase the heart rate at that point prolonged qt and hypocalcemia you guys can see that um it's kind of long it's not super um, a great ekg but what you'll get is that prolonged qt segment that's actually not too bad for that um, and then that short PR, you can see right there how short that is between there. So that's more indicative of potential underlying hypercalcemia that can cause that, but also the patient can go in some form of arrhythmia with a very fast uh, response. Uh, and again, all of these things, always think malignancy. Never forget about the brain. Work your way all the way up. Maybe they got something going on inside the brain. That can be a cause for all of these problems. That pituitary regulates so much of the endocrine system. Uh, you never know. So always think about that. And that's one thing, too. You know, you get that person with persistent headaches, you know, and they might have gynomastia or some other things. Another one to think about is drawing that prolactin level. If that prolactin level is elevated, there may be something going on up there. However, there's also medications that can cause that, like Seroquel, Haldol, calcium channel blockers. So you got to really kind of rule those things out. But prolactin levels, a lot of times with those patients that have significant uh, migraines and other things, that's something that you can use to potentially look for um, tumors in the absence of medications that may increase it or uh, other symptoms that you see. So I just want to go over a couple of three scenarios really quick. Um, um, so scenario number one, your 34 year old male reports to the ED complaining of nausea, vomiting, dizziness, and headache for three days. So that spawns a ton of differentials. Okay. If you're in my area, you know, you also think about drug ingestion. That's something that that's there. Uh, maybe the person has been binging. Um, you know, you also think about things like meningitis. Um, you also think about things like, you know, is this person now a new onset diabetic, all those kind of other things, but your differentials spawn all through the roof. I mean, that doesn't give you too much information, but it's something there. It may just be a URI, um, may just be a viral syndrome. You don't know. He does have a history of bipolar disorder. He has a history of seizures and gastritis. Um, Bipolar disorder, is he on his medications? Is he withdrawing from his medications? So that can cause differentials increase as well. He doesn't have any recent illness, uh, no recent seizures, no trauma. He denies any fevers or chills, so that kind of decreases maybe some form of infection. No chest pain, shortness, breath, diarrhea, constipation, or urinary issues. So he's not peeing a ton, anything like that. So maybe 
maybe not uh, diabetic related, denies any alcohol or drug use, and he's brought in by a social worker. So there's definitely some mental health going on there as well, but you can't just say, no, it's just mental health. Like I said, differentials kind of spanning. This is kind of when it starts. We all know that as we're asking questions, we're always thinking about it. And one thing I always think about, especially when I work in the ER, um, is I always start with the life threats first. Okay. So does the person have meningitis? Does the person have DKA? You know, those kind of things. Or the, what's going to kill them first? Um, he's a little bit young for having some form of cerebral accident, but you never know. You know, you never know. So vital signs, uh, blood pressure is pretty stable, 109 or 78. His pulse is tiny bit elevated. Otherwise, he doesn't look too bad as far as vital signs go. Um, his weight's a little bit elevated. He may be obese in some way. Medications, he takes a meprazole for his gastritis. He takes Pepsid with it also. Um, he takes Kepra for the seizures, Depakote probably for the seizures, but also for his mental health bipolar disorder, and he's on lithium. So these kind of, there's some serious interactions between those medications, and a lot of those, with the exception of omeprazole and Pepsid, um, can have significant interactions with the Keppra, the Depakote, and the lithium. So is his lithium level through the roof, too? That's another one. I need to check a lithium level. I need to check a VPA level because maybe those things are causing it as well. So physical exam. He's alert and oriented times four. No obvious mania. His pupils are pearl. You're not seeing any significant neurological signs. He walks in and out of the room. You see him when you're sitting at your desk. When they room him, he looks okay. His cardiac exam is pretty much benign. His lungs look good. Um, his abdomen looks fine. You do a quick endo check with up in here. You don't see any goiter, no thyroid megaly. And then his skin exam is pretty normal. So otherwise, he's pretty benign. So you get this patient who's got these active complaints but his his physical exam is benign his vital signs are benign there's something going on this is when diagnostics come in so if you can't rule it out that's when diagnostics are used you don't just want to rapid fire all this stuff at a patient you're always looking for i don't know exactly what's going on right now i need something to confirm my suspicion so that i'm moving on from that point so um, I use this for a uh, lecture at a university, too. So that would be spawning, hey, what's next? You would order a CBC looking for infection. Uh, CMP, you're looking for electrolytes and um, renal function. They've been throwing up all the time. Maybe they're losing electrolytes. Uh, maybe their kidney function is bumped. Magnesium level with potassium, you always want those two together. Do they have pancreatitis? The VPA, the lithium level, urinalysis, and for dehydration and infection, and then also utox is very important. EKG, why would you do it, right? But you don't know. There might be an irregularity in there. He's taking all those medications. You don't know. There may be some kind of underlying cardiac thing as well. Chest x-ray, you're looking for infection in there. Um, you're looking for cardiomegaly. There maybe there's a mass or something going on in there. Uh, the mediastinum may be big. He's been throwing up for a while. You never know. Um, CT of the brain, maybe not right off the bat, but it's something to think about if the person becomes altered or something in some way. And then think about anything else at that point. So this is your EKG you get. Um, remember, you always start lead two at the bottom. This is where you're looking for your arrhythmia. So um, this is your um, uh, bipolar lead. So it's looking from that just kind of straight down axis, top of the bottom of the heart. Um, you're looking for P waves, QRS, you're looking for a T wave, you got them all there. It's definitely fast. Um, the PR interval is normal. Otherwise, it's not irregular. So this looks like a sinus tachycardia. Uh, next thing I look for is the cardiac axis here. So I go up into this area. And so what you're doing is, remember, you divide the EKG in half. So these are your frontal leads, which is top to bottom. And these are your um, horizontal or, unip or um, sorry, uh, precordial leads, which kind of look from the back of the heart out towards the left breast. You know, unless you have dextrocardia, then it's the other way. Um, so what you're going to do is, I, one thing I always think about it, R is right, L is left, F is feet. So that's where these are looking for. So this is left shoulder, right shoulder, and foot. So what you're looking for is that which one of these is the tallest, QRS complex, because anytime an impulse is traveling t 
towards a lead, a positive of a lead, it's going to be increased, uh, elevated above the isoelectric line. If it's traveling away from it, it's going to be going down away from it. So it's going towards um, AVF, towards the feet, but it's going away from the right shoulder. Um, and then, you know, if you if you wanted to look, even get crazier, you could look at which one of these is the most elevated. Um, and this is being obviously lead two, which looks towards the left hip. So left, so here, and one way you can look at it, as long as it's going towards the left hip, but it's going away from the right shoulder, that's pretty much a normal access. Um, I'll have other lectures, which I can kind of go over that, help that kind of clarify that a little bit. That may have been kind of confusing. Um, from that point on, then I look for any EKG changes. Um, I'm going to look for any ST changes. You know, lateral leads are here and here, um, inferior leads, and then all the way through. So I don't really see anything standing out at this point. So it's pretty much just a sinus tachycardia with a normal uh, EKG. Chest X-ray, same thing. You always find one um, pattern that you follow, A, B, C, D, E. Looks like a normal heart. Mediastinum is normal. I don't see anything going on within the lungs. The angles are there. Uh, I don't see any abnormal um, ribs or any kind of fractures of the, of the spine or from the shoulders, anything like that. So my lab results come back. Um, he's got a little bit of a microcytic anemia, but it's nothing that's super crazy right now. Um, patients should probably follow up with some stool studies and primary care setting and look for any potential reason why. Um, if you, you know, he's got gastritis, so he may be bleeding in there. A patient may benefit from an uh, EGD or a colonoscopy later, but that's not something in the ER I'm definitely going to go after right now. CMP, you find his sodium is 123. So remember we talked about before, that's too low, right? Less than 135. So if your sodium level is high, you worry about diabetes insipidus. If your sodium level is low, you worry about SIADH, okay? So it's low. Magnesium, a little bit low, not too bad. Lipase is normal. Everything else is pretty much within normal limits. But you also notice that um, the, the patient's uh, specific gravity okay, is high. So holding on to fluid in some way. So my suspicion for SAEDH has just gone up, especially we're looking at his uh, prescription history of taking Keppra, uh, taking all those kind of other medications. So what do you think? Do you admit or don't you? Um, patient may look great, but his sodium level is pretty dang low. That may decrease further. A patient may start getting neurogenic problems or other problems. So this patient should be admitted. So fluid restriction, you want to bring... Um, that up or that uh, you, he's already dilute too much. That's why that sodium level is low. Do you see the causing medication, lithium, Depakote, Keppra would be another one. Consult psychiatry if he's got that, and you're going to want to admit this patient. Further workup, you could do at ADH level. Like I said, I don't have that availability here, but something that you could do that could cue you in right away. His serum osmolarity is low, okay, because he's so full of fluid, but the urine is high because he doesn't have a bunch of fluid in the urine, and then the sodium level is high as well in the urine. All right, so his diagnosis, SIADH caused by his medications. Patient actually has. The next one, 28-year-old female, reports the ED complaining of abdominal pain and, vag and uh, vomiting for one week, okay? She's 28, ectopic pregnancy, ovarian torsion, um, append or appendicitis, um, you can think of all those kind of things. And again, stop way up high, worst thing, worst case scenario. No known history, no surgeries, no illnesses, no, states no chance on pregnancy. She's already taking Sprintec, um, doesn't use any alcohol, and she doesn't have any fevers or chills or other things. Vital signs, she's 98 over 60, but we say she's not, she's not a very big person, she's 135. Pulse rate is definitely elevated. Um, she doesn't have a temperature. Her respiratory rate is normal, all that kind of stuff. Um, but that doesn't look horribly. I mean, she may be a little bit dehydrated with that blood or that heart rate. She takes Sprintec. She takes a daily vitamin. She's never missed any doses of her uh, hormone therapy. So her physical exam, 
she's alert and oriented times force, but she's holding out emesis spaces. So she's actively throwing up. Um, pupils are pearl. She's no obvious deficits. Um, DTRs are normal, upper and lower, but she needs help getting in and out of bed due to weakness. She says, I got to use the restroom. Okay. She's tachycardic, but you don't see any uh, problems otherwise doing her cardiac examination. Her lungs are clear. Abdomen is soft, non tender. You don't see any nodules or anything. She's pale. She's warm. Um, you uh, do notice that, you know, her skin signs are, are kind of out of whack a little bit. And she has does have some history of, uh, you know, previous track marks noted there as well. So thoughts. So, you know, looked at that again, you know, and nothing's super popping out. However, she is vomiting. She doesn't look good. She's slightly tachycardic, even though she doesn't have like a fever and meat sepsis criteria. There's something going on and she doesn't look very good. So I need to figure out more. So orders for the, her, obviously, CBC, CMP, magnesium lipase, lactate, because you're going to look for, you know, sepsis in some way. That pregnancy test is important. The Utox, like we always said, all these things are important. Does she have pancreatitis? She's throwing up constantly. Um, another thing you might think about is an alcohol level. Um, you might think of, you know, um, a Tylenol level, all those kind of things, because you don't exactly know uh, exactly her psychiatric history as well. EKG, she may be an underlying arrhythmia. QT syndrome may be off. Um, she may be on something otherwise, but you got to make sure that that tachycardia isn't something else going on. Chest x-ray, you're looking for those, you know, infection in the lungs. But here's the EKG you get, okay? Again, we're looking at this. Um, you always start at the bottom here. So what I'm looking at here is I definitely see, you know, it's not super fast, but I see a shortened PR interval here. Definitely something I see here. Um, so that is concerning, you know, like we talked about calcium, calcium levels, hypercalcemia, other things like that. Patient may be getting in and out of some form of paroxysmal uh, tachycardia. When I go up here and I look through, um, her access is normal because that's upright, that's positive. This is negative. These are polar opposites of each other. So this looks at the right shoulder. This looks at the left hip. So if you just go straight across, right, okay, like this. Right? It's going straight through the heart. That's correct. And as I go through, um, she definitely has a little bit of delay in depolarization. Um, some, you know, uh, depression here and here and here. Um, but it's kind of, you know, through the through these leads, but it's not 100% specific on anything. So that main thing I'm seeing that. So I get the chest x-ray. Heart looks a little bit large, but I'm not seeing anything major standing out as far as the x-rays go. So your lab's re results return. CBC, white count is barely elevated. Glucose is 682. So right off the bat, that's way too high, right? Now, is the patient in HHS or is the patient in deep? diabetic ketoacidosis, or is the patient just having a high blood sugar? She doesn't know she has a history of anything. Remember the um, hyperosmolic state, that's where you have a high blood sugar, you have a um, uh, evidence of dehydration with a high serum osmolarity level, but you don't have ketones and you don't have uh, acidosis. Whereas DKA is the opposite. You get high sugar levels, but you get uh, acidosis and you get ketones as well. So potassium is low, sodium is low. So high glucose 682 with a CO2 that's low, I'm really concerned for DKA at this point. Magnesium is low, lipase is normal, lactate is elevated. Again, DKA, I'm worried. Glucose, tons of it in the urine, tons of ketones in the urine, and HCG is negative. Okay. So I'm really worried about DK at this point. Okay. Is there any ad labs you would add? If you want to fully figure this out, right, that's when you need to do your VBG, ABG. Now I would do a VBG. Um, you could do a certain ketone level, VBG cultures, in case there's some form of infection going on. So certain ketones come back high, VBG or ABG, but you could do either one. I again would do the VBG. So you see, pH level is low, acidotic, CO2 is low, bicarb is low, 
right? So that's metabolic acidosis. And then the AG with the anion gap is high. So that's high anion gap acidosis, metabolic acidosis. So this person's in DKA, okay? And those are kind of like your reference. Diagnosis, DKA. So this person's going to be NPO, right? They're going to get tons of fluids, right? You're going to replace their potassium, their magnesium. And then you're going to think about insulin at that point, and then you're going to admit the person, right? Now, if their um, bicarb level is low, less than 6.9, then you're going to have to give them bicarb. Oh, and again, this is what we were just talking about. Last one, real quick. 51-year-old female reports to the ED complaining of a headache and palpitations for two weeks, right? So 51, um, complaining of headache and palpitations. Now, she's a little bit older. You don't know what her meds are yet. You don't know what her history is yet. Is she going into RBR? Uh, she have a history of, or maybe have some form of neurological issue. She getting clots, something going on within her head. Um, um, she having some form of uh, vascular problem within her carotids. All those kind of things are important. Uh, she has no known history, no surgeries. Um, her RLS is pretty much negative, and she denies any alcohol or drug use. So your differentials are kind of all over the place at this point. But you can definitely think of quite a few. Vital signs, she's definitely elevated in her blood pressure, right? No history, no medications. Her pulse rate is way up. 142, um, let's just say... Um, I guess I don't know the irregularity at that point, if it is regular or not. Respiratory rate's up. Uh, weight's good. She's not super skinny um, otherwise, but she's definitely hypertensive, and she's definitely very um, elevated in her pulse. She takes Premarin, so that's kind of concerning, especially if you have an elevations in her um, heart rate because that's a, um, a hormone, an estrogen-type hormone, which can predispose you to having some form of uh, pulmonary embolism of some point, of some sort, or some kind of clot somewhere else, right? She takes a daily vitamin, um, and she also takes vitamin D and calcium. Physical exam, uh, you don't see much on neuro. Uh, she's definitely tachycardic, but you don't hear any carotid bruises or worries for um, any form of dissection or something like that going on. JVD is fine. Um, abdomen, lungs look good. Uh, thyroid looks good. You don't see anything else. Skin down there, I'm sorry. That seems like it's from the last one. Let's just say that she's pink, warm, and dry. So thoughts, right? So I have a high heart rate. Um, I have headaches. I have a woman on Premarin. So there's the differentials that I am worried about, right? So I'm worried about PE. I'm worried about some kind of cardiac issue, neurological issue, other cardiovascular issues, uh, and endocrine issues are other ones that I think about as well. So initial orders, all the same stuff. You're always going to check that troponin, especially on an older person. You want to make sure D-dimer, while it's not 100% specific, any elevations in that can be concerning for underlying um, PE. Now, if there's high suspicion, there's a lot of, there's a camps that say you just scan it with a CTA, you don't know. Um, but some people say you still check the level, but it also can be elevated in uh, any kind of um, thoracic aneurysms, which could be on your list as well. Um, lactate, PTINR. So if you do have to give some form of um, anticoagulation, you're definitely going to want to know those levels. TSH, free T4, she's tachycardic, she's hypertensive. Um, definitely going to want to check thyroid levels. And then your analysis, you're looking for infection, you're looking for proteins, how their kidneys are doing, and then utox, because that could be a cause for this problem as well. EKG, why is it so high? Is it in and out of SCT? Is it PSVT? Is it AFib? Is there short PR? All those kind of other things. Chest X-ray, cardiomegaly, you're looking for the mediastinum. Is there... Uh, evidence of a potential underlying uh, thoracic aneurysm. You're also looking for rowels and all kinds of other things. The patient may have a pneumothorax. You don't know, right? So this is her EKG. Definitely tachycardic at the bottom. You can see there's a couple PVCs. Um, otherwise, there's not really much else standing out in this patient. A um, little bit of uh, inverted T wave here, but I don't necessarily see it here and here, so the inferior portion, but I definitely see tachycardia there, and there's a little bit of a delay in repolarization here. This should normally be the tallest here, and that goes right towards the apex of the heart, okay? 
definitely a cardiomegaly there. Um, I don't see anything else, but the heart is rather large. Lab results, everything seems pretty much normal. Troponin's normal, D-dimer's normal. Um, TSH uh, is normal, free T4 is normal. Um, you know, urinalysis is normal. The only thing you find on her Utox, though, is um, that she has marijuana uh, in there. So you're kind of stumped at that point. What, what is going on? Because there's obviously something going on. She obviously has high blood pressure. She obviously has tachycardia. You know, you're trying to think outside the box. And a lot of times that's when those endocrine type things come in. Maybe I should consider an endocrine related problem. So, you know, say you do a CT of the brain, you're trying to figure out what's going on. The person has headaches, she's vomiting, you know, does she have a for, you know, some form of, um, a uh, hemorrhage going on, subarachnoid hemorrhage. You look at that. You might even think, should I do a lumbar puncture? I don't know. But, you know, all in all, you got to at least kind of think down to it. And this person um, eventually turned out to have a fetal chromocytoma. So that she has headaches. Remember, she's tachycardic. She's anxious. She got high blood pressure. I got to figure out why. So say she got admitted and then she found out they had the, the um, feel. So heart rate. Blood pressure controlled, usually that's something like propranolol, beta blocker, calcium channel blockers, if you're going to be admitted, uh, endocrinology, they're probably going to surgically remove it. Um, if you don't have those availability at your hospital, the patient's going to be transferred. Um, while they're admitted, that's where you're going to identify it through these unfractionated catecholamines uh, and testing within their urine. If positive, you're going to do the abdominal pevis CTs. And here's, here's an example. This is a huge one. But you can see it on MRI right there, sitting right on top of the kidneys. Big one. So that's it. I, so I hope that makes sense. Um, I just wanted to go over some of these things that we don't see. The main ones are I like to, especially with students, is like when you're like, I don't know what diabetes insipidus is versus SIADH versus, you know, that hyperosmolar state versus ketoacidosis. Those things that's uh, that those are the main ones that I want you guys to understand and also understand that endocrine disorders a lot of times are lower down on the list and not always caught right off the bat but it's something that needs to be considered within your differential because it may be part of the problem um, and you need to delve a little deeper a lot of times especially in the ER you're seeing these you're you're working them up and not finding anything then they get admitted and then a lot of times these things are found out unless they come in with something like an adrenal crisis and you know and you can't wait for labs and so you just basically give them you know hydrocortisone to try to stimulate things going on so um yeah. So anyway, I, I really thank you for uh, listening. Um, if you have any questions, I have my email address there. Uh, any, you know, constructive criticism, anything I could do better, please let me know. Uh, and again, thanks to uh, uh, Sharon and to APP to APP for allowing me to lecture again. Hope you all have a good holiday. Thanks.